This is the Lightning Podcast, a show dedicated to inspiring God's people to read, study, and meditate on His Word. I'm your host, Adam Casalino. And this episode marks a new series, uh, Lord willing, where I'm going to spend a little more time journeying through a particular book in the Bible. Previous episodes and most of what I've done so far, I've kind of jumped around, mostly focusing on different topics I felt uh, valuable to discuss with a view of hopefully encouraging you, the listener, to dig into either a particular passage of scripture or perhaps a particular issue or topic that the Bible covers to motivate you, encourage you to grow deeper in your knowledge of the Word so you grow deeper in your relationship with God. But now I wanted to try something new something that I'm pretty excited about, and Lord willing, it might be a number of episodes moving forward where we look at one particular book of the Bible and read it in its proper context from the beginning to end with a view of learning from it what God is teaching us. I had a a number of books in mind, but what really jumped out to me, which I thought would be so valuable, is the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, The book of Samuel actually covers a number of key people And it's a very personal book. It deals deeply with these people's lives and what they're going through and how God uh, played such a significant role in their life, particularly their individual relationships with God. So I thought it's so valuable to look at as believers, as followers of Christ, to learn from this book how God wants to relate to us. One of the biggest themes of 1 Samuel is how God is both interested in the corporate body of his people, but also deeply interested in our individual lives. Because we see in the book of 1 Samuel how God is working through Israel to accomplish his purpose, mainly to fulfill his promises made to them that they become a great and mighty nation. But in order to accomplish this, he's working through the lives of individual people in unlikely places and scenarios to accomplish his plan. So there's so much we could learn from this book. So this episode, I'm going to focus on mainly Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 1, and we're going to look at the lives of a few key people, very key people that are only in the book for a short time, but play a significant role in the rest of the book. So before I jump into the text, let's look at a little bit of the history uh, going on in uh, Israel at this time. As we explore the Old Testament, we are watching God fulfill his promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob over the course of a long period of time. Israel starts out as a small family, literally one man and one woman, and eventually grows into this great and mighty nation. And at their peak of power, under King Solomon, they are essentially the most influential nation in the world. People from all over the world flock to Israel to learn from them and to share in their prosperity and success. And over the course of many, many generations, and of course, and over the course of many books of the Bible, we see God fulfill that promise through many people's lives. And First and Second Samuel are key books in, in the key transition where Israel goes from a ragtag group of tribes constantly battling and, and fighting for a scrap of land in the promised land into a great, powerful nation, a kingdom. So at the time of First Samuel, this is shortly after the era of the Judges, When God rescued Israel out of Egypt, it was basically just a nation of people. They didn't have their own land. They didn't have their own government. They even didn't really have much of their own way of life. They had been living in Egypt for many years, 400 years. They went from a small family of roughly 70 people with Jacob and his sons and their grandchildren and all that into a nation of about a million or so people. So they were a nation, they were an ethnic group, they had their own identity as far as going back to their forefathers, but they they weren't a country yet, they weren't a government yet. So God used Moses to deliver them out of Egypt into the wilderness where he gave them the law. And I've said in a previous podcast, the law was more than just rules that they were supposed to live by. It was God was giving them their identity, their national identity, their, their heritage, who they were as a people where all the Gentile nations around them got their identity from paganism, false gods, sinful behavior and lifestyle, Israel was meant to be marked as God's people in that every area of their life, from what they ate to what they wore to how they managed their homes, their farms, to their religious worship, to their government, all of it was to be determined and guided by Almighty God, the one true God. And a part of that was to be a witness to the world around them that had fallen so deep into darkness. And of course, we see that parallel in our lives today. We may not be an ethnic group like Israel, but all of those who believe in Jesus Christ are his people. We've been grafted into a spiritual family of God, both Jews and Gentiles. And we are, just like the ancient Israelites, meant to be different than the world around us. 
that every aspect of our life is to be marked by the Word of God. That doesn't mean that we have to worry about how we eat or, or is this the right type of clothing or, or, or minor issues like that. Paul says those are just types and shadows of the fullness that's in Jesus. The way we live our life, the way we speak, the way we conduct our behavior, the way we treat other people is supposed to be marked by a relationship with Almighty God, just like the Israelites. And that is especially true when it comes to sin and righteousness. So God gave them their identity through the law, through Moses, and then through Joshua, he led them into the promised land. And after Joshua, there was a period of time where they were ruled by judges, and this was appointed by God. Deuteronomy 16, verses 18 through 20, establish how the nation was to be governed. There's, there's a variety of rules and things that determine this, but this is a key passage. The Lord commands them through Moses, You are to appoint judges and officials from your tribes in every town that the Lord your God is giving you. They are to judge the people with righteous judgment. Do not deny justice or show partiality. Do not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. Pursue justice and justice alone so that you may live and that you may possess the land that your Lord God is giving you. So in this passage, we see that according to God's uh, commandments, Israel was to be organized with judges and officials from the tribes. So they're made up of 12 tribes. They were each given a portion of land. And within those tribes, they were to choose judges who would uh, decide cases for them. So they didn't have you know, elected officials like we would have. These, are, these came out of their own families, respected elders who were responsible for making decisions. Apart from that, the national leaders were meant to be the priests from the tribe of Levi. They weren't given their own land, but they were given cities spread out the entire nation, and the high priest would serve in the tabernacle and orchestrate the religious, spiritual uh, life of Israel through the sacrifices and all of the things that dictated by the law. So we see, according to God's plan, there's two types of leadership that governed Israel at this time. There were the high priests that were meant to instruct the Israelites in the the word of God and the commandments in the Torah through the worship. And then there were judges and other officials from the tribes that were based on the righteousness of God's law were meant to judge in the issues that would come up. And the law was very clear about right and wrong and, and things like that. There were laws that dictated all of that. So the judges, their goal was to know that law and then to act on it righteously. And through that, they would also be instructing the Israelites. So they had these two groups of people who were meant to be to serve the Lord and to guide the people, much like shepherds leading sheep, in the things of God. But if you are familiar with the book of Judges, that's not often the case. Every generation, the people would turn away and serve their own desires. In fact, they would get into trouble. God would raise up a judge who would rule the entire nation and usually as like a military leader, kind of like... Joshua, they would overthrow their enemies, and for a time they would go back to worshiping God. But after that generation passed, they would go back to doing things that they cared about. A term that repeats itself in Judges is that everyone did what was right in his own eyes. In fact, the last verse of Judges, chapter 21, verse 25, it said, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So that was the condition of Israel at this time. A group of tribes that were constantly fighting to settle the land, to occupy the land against their enemies. And when they were obedient to the Lord, they prospered. But time and again, they turned away, seeking after uh, all the false gods of the neighbors around them in order to indulge in their own sinful behavior, as the Bible says, what was right in their own eyes. Meaning, they thought it was good, they did it. They didn't look to the word and say, is this what God commands us to do? They did what they thought was good, which of course in human nature is always sin. Very rarely does a person, if they decide what's right in their own eyes, they're just going to do what God says because they'll make excuses and compromise and indulge in their own fleshly desires. So that was the world of Israel at the opening of 1 Samuel 1. And you may ask yourself, well, why weren't the local tribal judges being obedient. Well, they, like the rest of the neighbors, did what was right in their own eyes. But then you say, what about the high priests? They were given the law. They were given all the temple worship and the sacrifices and the tabernacle and the altars. Why weren't they, at the very least, commanding Israel to obey? Well, we'll see that. We'll see in 1 Samuel very clearly how the high priests themselves were compromising uh, the word of God and doing what they had wanted. 
So the circumstances that we see at the opening of 1 Samuel, Israel is kind of in peril. They're in the promised land. They have the land that they God had promised them, but they're not really prospering. And it's a direct result of their disobedience to God's commands. And we see God setting a stage for there to be a strong leader, a strong lineage that will unite the nation and bring them to the place that God promised them to be. God promised Abraham that all the nations of the world will be blessed by his people. Ultimately, that is found through Christ. We know that it all goes to Jesus. But in the process of that, the nation is supposed to be blessed and prosperous. But every generation, they turn back and start worshiping false gods, jeopardizing the covenant they had with Almighty God. But despite this, there were still a remnant of people who were faithful to the Lord. Just like in every age, in every era, there are people who are true to the Almighty God, despite what others might be doing. It's 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1, it begins, Now there was a certain man of Ramathiam Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved her, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. So we'll stop right there. That's verse 1 through 7, very beginning of 1 Samuel. And we learn about the story of a man named Elkanah and his family. Now we learn in other passages of scripture, Elkanah was actually a Levite a member of the tribe who were given cities across Israel. And within that tribe, the sons of Aaron were served as priests and high priests at the tabernacle. And so the Levites were set apart by God to serve as priests and spiritual leaders within the nation of Israel. Elkanah is here called an Ephraimite because he lived in the land of Ephraim, which is one of the tribes, but uh, he was a Levite. He lived there, and that's why he was called an Ephraimite. This particular region is often called Ramah, shortened, and it's a region not that far from Jerusalem, kind of in the central uh, portion of the land of Israel. And we see here, according to the scriptures, he was faithful to the commandments of God. Deuteronomy 16 says that all of Israel is meant to go up to the tabernacle three times a year to sacrifice and participate in the feasts of the Lord. In verse 16, it says, Three times a year all your men are to appear before the Lord your God in the place he will choose at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. No one should appear before the Lord empty-handed. Everyone must appear with a gift as he is able, according to the blessing the Lord your God has given you. And there's other passages that relate to this and go into detail, but we see Elkanah was faithful in that. It could be because he was a Levite, and so uh, unlike some of the other tribes or some of the other families, they were more devoted to studying and teaching the law. Unlike so many other Israelites, he was obedient to the Lord, but there was a problem. And we see that very clearly in this passage of Scripture. And this first chapter of 1 Samuel shows a very strong contrast between two different types of people. See, Elkanah had two wives, and if you're familiar with the Old Testament, that was a common thing. It's what we call polygamy. Now, it might be confusing to you because you might be taught and should be taught that that's wrong. Okay, the Bible clearly teaches that marriage is between one man and one woman, and that's it. But again and again, we see many of God's people, including important people, godly people, had multiple wives. And we could brush that off as, oh, that was culture at the time, but Scripture never endorses that. In fact, there are passages that warn that the rulers of God's people should never have more than one wife. And every time scripture talks about a man having multiple wives, it is never good. It never works out. Whether it's Abraham, whether it's Jacob, whether it's David or Solomon, and whether it's here, this man, Elkanah. But why did he have two wives? Was he just just this ridiculously lustful man who just needed more women to please him? Well, what's so interesting is that there may have been a very rational excuse for him to have a second wife, and that was because of Hannah's inability to have children. Now, you're probably not surprised how important it is for a wife to bear children. In our day and age, families usually have 
children because it, that's what you do. You love your husband and wife and having kids is an expression of that love. And we also know biblically it's important for us to raise the next generation of children who will know God and trust God and, and can continue on sharing the gospel of the world. We know that. But in the Old Testament and, and much of human history, it was vitally important to have children for a number of reasons. For the most part, if you had no children, where would your inheritance go? If a man didn't have kids, particularly if he didn't have any sons, whatever inheritance that he had earned from his family, especially what he had earned through the course of his life working and laboring, would just go away. It would end up to a distant relative or to a cousin or maybe to a neighbor or someone. And obviously you didn't want that. People, even to, to this day, work and strive to earn something to pass on to their children. Another reason was to carry on your family name, especially amongst God's people. They were called for a destiny to serve God, and that destiny would continue after they were gone. So if they didn't have kids to continue on that fam their, their destiny, their purpose, their family name, it would be like their, their lineage would end with them. And with a woman, there was even more uh, necessity because she was taken into this man's home, given a home, given a portion, given a livelihood, a life, love, romance. So she would want to give back to her husband many, many children. So that's normal. That's not a big surprise. But in addition to that, a common desire amongst Jewish women uh, was the promise of the Messiah. Now, throughout the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, we see God gradually revealing more and more of his plan for redemption across Scripture. It's what we call progressive revelation. He didn't tell us all at once in the book of Genesis what he was planning to do. He gave us a little bit and over time added to it as we gained an understanding of his ultimate goal fully revealed in Jesus Christ. At the very beginning, he promised Adam and Eve that there would be a seed from the woman who would crush the head of the serpent. That was the first promise of the Messiah. A descendant from a woman would come and defeat the enemy who had just uh, defeated Adam and Eve through a deception. And that promise was continued. God used similar terminology with Abraham saying, your seed would go on to do this. Okay, promising the, the, that all nations on the earth will be blessed by his seed refers to not just the nation of Israel, his descendants, but this promised one. And the idea of the Messiah developed over time as God continued to reveal that. And the term Messiah becomes very prominent in the Psalms and other places, the anointed chosen one. So a good Israelite woman who knew this, who knew this story, was passed down through scripture, through all the prophets, uh, including Moses, they would have known that one day this Redeemer, this this Savior, this seed would come. So even, that's even more important why they would want to have children, because maybe they would uh, produce this Messiah or, or at least be a part of that process, which we know through Jesus there were many people who gave birth and created this lineage to produce one day at the appointed time Jesus. So there was all these reasons why a woman in Israel at that time would want to bear a son. And the kind of frustration that Hannah would have felt not being able to have a child. But this is where Elkanah failed. Although he may have been faithful to go to the temple and offer up sacrifices and worship, he saw this problem and he decided to solve it in his own understanding, in his own reasoning. So his wife couldn't have a baby, so that's fine. I'll go marry another woman who could have babies for me. All right, this is not even the first time this has happened. This has happened repeatedly in scripture, and it never worked out, and Elkanah should have known better. What he was doing there, he thought he was fixing the problem, but he was only doing it for himself. Maybe in his thought, in his mind, he rationalized, well, this will take the pressure off Hannah. She won't feel bad anymore that I, she can't give me a son because this woman will give me sons. And hey, I'm keeping Hannah around. I could have sent her away. I could have divorced her. I could have abandoned her, but I'm keeping her around as my wife. I just had this other woman have babies for me. So maybe in his mind, it was very likely that he thought he was fixing the problem the right way, but really he was just doing it to please himself. He wanted kids. He probably was impatient. So he married another woman so he could have his, his descendants, his heir. And Hannah, she was left behind. The, the reality is he created a much greater problem trying to do it that way than doing it the biblical way because it didn't make Hannah feel better. The Bible says she was miserable. And just like in other stories in the Bible, this repeats many times, the woman who had the kids mistreated the woman who didn't have kids. That happened with Hagar and Sarah, and that happened with Leah and Rachel, and now it's happening with Hannah and Peniah. She actually mocked her and provoked her because she had all these kids, and apparently she had lots of kids because they mentioned all her sons and daughters, and Hannah had no one. 
So think about this. Elkanah outwardly was obeying God by going to the tabernacle and sacrificing, but in his own life, he was doing things that suited himself. And he's violating what it says in Scripture, in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 4, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. What Elkanah was doing was wrong. He had a problem, yeah. He tried to solve it on his own understanding by simply getting another wife. What should he have done? He should have sought the Lord for his answer. How many of us as Christians go to church and we do those religious things we know we're supposed to do, just like Elkanah? We go up and we every Sunday morning we worship, we give our tithes and offerings, we hold our Bible. Yes, thank you, Pastor. What a good day. I'm a good Christian. But when the rubber meets the road, when we go to quote unquote real life, back to real life and face real problems, are we going to go to the Lord for our solutions and do things a biblical way, or are we going to try to solve the problem in our own understanding? There are Christians out there who will profess Christ and do all the religious things, but when they face problems, they'll seek people outside the church or outside God's prescribed solution. They'll look at doctors or psychologists or uh, financial experts and gurus, and, and they'll look at all these teachings or ideas or look at their own rationality and look at all the, all the issues on paper and weigh the options, the pros and the cons, and all these things. And in their own mind, they think they're doing the right thing. But they're trusting in their own wisdom, in their own ability, instead of seeking the Lord. So why did Elkanah do it? Why do so many of us do it, so many Christians do it? Because ultimately we're wanting a solution that makes us happy rather than go through what God is trying to accomplish. See, Elkanah fixed, quote unquote, the problem that made him happy in a way that made him happy. He got his kids, but he was leaving Hannah in the dust. Yeah, he didn't send her away. He didn't divorce her or leave her destitute. He kept her as a wife. But imagine how Hannah would have felt. She married him. She had so many hopes and aspirations for their relationship. And now she has to play second fiddle to this other woman. Every time in scripture where it discusses uh, polygamy, it's never positive. We always see the fallout. God is showing us the damage it causes to people when a woman has to compete with her husband with another woman. That's so unhealthy. That's so outside of God's biblical pattern, which is a one man, one woman, together united in marriage. But Elkanah wasn't thinking about that. He just wanted a quick, a shortcut solution to his problem, what made him happy immediately. And he didn't consult the word of God. And he would have known this was the wrong choice because he would have known the story of Abraham and Sarah. The story is in Genesis 16. So you could say, well, Elkanah didn't know Proverbs. That wasn't written yet. Yeah, but he probably would have known a Genesis 16. And it says at verse 1, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go up into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarai said to Abram, be, My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. And the story goes on. It's, it's a very painful, ugly chapter in the life of these patriarchs. But we clearly see the problems it created when Abraham married another woman. And again, they were trying to fix their problem. God had promised a child to Abraham and Sarah, and in the due course of time, they did receive that child, Isaac, but they were impatient. They wanted to fix things for themselves, so Abraham did something crazy, and he married another woman and had a baby with her, and that created more a strife in their family. So scripture makes it very clear. Elkanah should have known, don't do this. But had he turned to the Lord and said, Lord, please heal my wife and give her a child, maybe he had to wait. Maybe he had to go uh, 10 years before he had a kid. And he didn't want to wait. Or maybe God would never have answered the prayer and he would never have had kids. But maybe that was a part of God's plan. Maybe he had something else in store for Elkanah. But instead, he quickly rushed and fixed the problem himself, making an even bigger problem. And we see, as 1 Samuel chapter 1 continues, God did have a plan, an amazing plan, to not only answer this problem, but produce a mighty man of God who would go on to be a great prophet and judge. So God had a plan all along. But Elkanah, in his stubbornness, wanted to do things his own way. So the lesson that we could take from this is that when we're facing troubles and trials, 
not to try to solve things in our own power. And even though we go to church and participate in all the religious duties that God requires of us, unless in our hearts we're seeking Him and His solutions for our lives, we're missing the mark. God doesn't want us to go to church just so it could be a routine that we do every week or every other week or every month or once a year. He wants us to know Him. And the problem that God allowed to happen in this family wasn't so that they could suffer. It was so that they could actually go to Him personally and seek Him for His solution. In the next episode, we're going to continue chapter 1, and we're going to see what Hannah did that was the opposite of Elkanah and how God used it not only to answer her prayer, but to draw her closer to God in a way that she wouldn't have known before. So tune in next time to Lightning Podcast. Every podcast is available at lightningpodcast.org. See you next time.